Hello, thank you very much, Fee, and hello, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the first of two Ask Me Anything sessions for today's event. And um, so, as Fee mentioned, I'm James Hawkins, one of the enterprise account executives here at Loyalty Lion. Uh, and we're joined by Ellie Bullen, um, one of our strategic customer success managers, and also Tom Vance, who is one of our senior software engineers as well. Um, as Fee said, just to, to reiterate, thanks everybody for sharing your questions in the Q&A. We've got a nice list here that we're going to be going through during this session. Um, and as we mentioned, if you haven't had the opportunity to submit any of those questions just yet, please feel free just to pop them in the chat um, and they'll get passed on to us so that we can hopefully address them during this session. Um, but don't worry if... Uh, don't worry if we, if we don't get to it during the session. There is the second Ask Me Anything session later on as well. Um, and indeed, if you do see any questions that you like and you think, actually, I want to know the answer to that as well, please feel free just to give it a little thumbs up um, and we can prioritise it during the conversation. Awesome. So with that in mind, then, let's jump straight in. We'll start with the first question. So the first question we've had is from Alec Lloyd. And that question was... What is the best way to gather first party data and have it link directly to our customers? The question I think is very, very pertinent at the moment. And uh, I'm actually going to hand that over to, to Tom to kick it off. Hi there. Yeah, I've got some, got some thoughts on that. I think um, something that's really important to think about is like how you incentivize giving like that data. So customers kind of, as we look forward, like collecting data used to be fairly easy, right? Like we had cookies and all these things where we could collect and track that data about our customers. As we look forward, like that's not as simple. Um, various changes recently have made it more and more complex to track that data. So we kind of need to collect it directly from the customers and they need to be willing to give it up. So it kind of has to be this like two-way relationship and like, I'm willing to give you that data, but I kind of want to get it back. Like I need to get something back out of that. So you could, you could look at giving points for completing surveys, uh, leaving reviews, that kind of thing is collecting first party data, um, but also on the flip side, giving back to the customer. Um, and also personalization comes in a lot, like if you can reward the customer for, for giving those points by showing different areas of the site, making that site more bespoke to them, it feels like you're kind of building up that two-way relationship. Um, and alongside that, like the, the trust goes a long way. So thinking about how you sort of look after that data and your data governance policy as you collect first-party data becomes very important. Um, as soon as you break that trust and lose some of that data or it leaks out, then... Uh, you're going to very quickly lose that. Less customers are going to give you and be willing to give you that data. Um, so yeah, I think good ways to collect it, surveys, reviews, incentivization, but then linking that to your general and overall like personalization strategy so that customers feel like they're giving it and getting stuff in return. Absolutely. And I, th I think that's something that we're seeing more and more of at the moment is that people are, are willing to share those data points with you um, if they feel like, to your point, Tom, that, that you are a trusted source that you are a company that, that they feel very much aligned with. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that, Tom. Um, awesome. So the next question that we have on the list has been asked by Jason uh, during one of the breakout sessions. Um, Jason asks, I would love to leverage user-generated content more and have several avenues to request it. The biggest issue has been the quality of the user-generated content we've received in the past. Do you have any tips for those of us outside of the beauty or apparel industries to get higher quality user generated content? Ellie, do you have any, any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think this is um, a really interesting one. I think for a lot of our merchants, getting user generated content is something that they have a big focus on. Um, and as you said, it would be interesting to know sort of what um, business you guys are in because I think as you said in terms of like apparel um, and the makeup industry and things like that it's a lot more inclined to actually giving that user generated content on social media and things so it'd be interested to to know exactly um, yeah what business you're in but I think in terms of actually getting that um, that content and getting it at a much higher standard I think you can really leverage loyalty to do that um, and there's a few ways that you can do it um, but one of the one of the key the key ways is actually levering, leveraging your higher tiered customers so those that are most engaged um, already in your brand and those that are spending more with you guys and they really um, uh, sort of come and, and shop with you guys time and time again 
reach out to them and try and get them to give you that that user generated content and as tom was saying in that previous question make sure that you're giving them back something in return and the way that you can do that is through your loyalty program um so things like uh, you know, giving points for that content and really focusing on that specific uh, group of customers with your tiers. Um, the other thing that you can look to to do with this is reviews as well. Uh, some of our review integrations allow um, allow you to have um, sort of images that you post um, as well as sort of the the, the text uh, content as well. Um, and just having more of a uh, an option to sort of regulate that and ensure that you're getting you know really good quality user generated content through that by giving points back for leaving them reviews with that content is a great way to do it. Um, so yeah, I think two things there, make sure that um, you're looking at your higher tiered customers if you do have a tiered program and really leverage that in terms of in terms of your loyalty program um, and ensure that you're, you're giving back through reviews and things like that as well. Make sure that you're giving them points back in order for, for the the content that you're receiving to be better um, and also communicating that as well right with your customers so if you are wanting really great quality um, UGC um, if you're doing it through reviews or, or doing it more specific with targeted groups um, make it more conversational and communicate that to customers when when you're doing it as well perfect thank you very much for that Ellie really good overview there um, awesome so moving on to the next question then um, this is a question that was asked by Joseph during, again, one of the breakout sessions. Uh, and that question is, how do you see that in-store customer outreach and online customer experience can integrate to maximize customer connection and improve loyalty? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I can speak on, on this one first, if you like. Um, I think there's a lot of things you can do, again, with loyalty to really ensure that you're pushing both in-store um, and online purchases and ensuring that you have sort of a combined strategy when it comes to the two of them. So if you do work with... Um, uh, sort of a POS partner ensuring that you are giving points for purchasing in store as well as online and when your customers are shopping in store ensure that the loyalty program is being you know promoted effectively in store so making sure that your store assistants are very aware of the program and how it works and how they make sure that customers can give points or redeem rewards in store. Um, what's also worked really successfully as well is having things like QR codes to your loyalty page um, in store so that customers can actually interact with that whilst they are completing their sort of in-store experience. Um, and then that links the two together right there and then when they're shopping. Um, and I think as well as that, make sure that you've then got um, uh, online pushing them customers in store as well. So you can do more, again, sort of like experience-based um, rewards. Again, if you wanted to do it um, sort of tier-led for your higher tiered customers, give them opportunities to do things in store um, and push them back that way as well. So both sort of shopping experience, whether whether customers do tend to come in store or online, your loyalty program is um, being pushed effectively through sort of both of them channels. But yeah, Tom, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, I guess I'd echo essentially what you were saying around like some good ways of like pushing customers who should mainly shop online, like in store. You can do things around like, um, so we have our collection bonus rule. Um, for example, if it's products that you specifically only sell in store, you can use that to offer bonus points for potentially purchasing those products. Um, some other things just in the general around like personalization. Um, location data is, is really valuable. If you know that customers are sort of in the London area or near one of your particular stores, for example, you can potentially incentivize and personalize their shopping experience around those stores. So you, for example, you could, you could display on, online, like, hey, in store, we have these discounts or this sale ongoing at the moment, like making sure that customers are aware of what that, what's actually going on in store and incentivizing them to come in and actually and do that and vice versa online, right? Like make sure that those things are a two way. So People who, are, who maybe shop only in-store incentivize them to come online with uh, sign-up points, for example, um, and things like that. Introductory offers, I guess, are a good, a good way. Um, yeah, I don't know if you had any thoughts at all, James, or anything you wanted to add on top of those. But Yeah, no, I, th I think, uh, uh, I think you, you guys have, have certainly covered off quite a lot there. I think the only thing I would really echo is, is, yeah, I think it's just about consistency, right? You want to make sure that if you are offering something across both channels, um, that the two do echo each other and complement each other, um, that they're not playing against each other, so to speak. Um, fantastic. So 
the next question we've got here is uh, is one that I actually come across quite a lot. Um, it's been asked by Holly during one of the sessions. Um, if you reward customers for subscribing, how would you suggest stopping customers from churning? So yeah, I mean, I think this is this is a topic that that we tend to discuss quite a lot because we we have a, a number of customers at the moment who who use subscriptions. It's a fantastic tool um, to also help improve retention. Um, and I think in, in regards to that question, how do you stop customers from churning? I think the first thing is to is to really sort of take it down to its basics. Really looking at when we when we're viewing that subscriber journey, where are we seeing the highest churn rate? And what I mean by that is traditionally, when we speak to customers who have a subscription element to the business, we will usually see that that, subs that churn rate tends to come around purchase three to four. It's kind of, you know, number one is the excitement. Number two is, oh, this is convenient. And then number three, we, we, we tend to see a little bit of drop off. Um, and I think what's key is, is identifying where those areas of, of high risk are and then using a rewards program um, strategically around those areas. So it can be certain things like identifying that after three purchases, for example, a customer will have accrued enough points to earn a free reward or something like that. Anything that's going to then encourage them over that high risk period and then into the next set of purchases. Um, I'm not sure if, uh, Ellie, if you have any thoughts or Tom? Yeah, I think definitely um, echo what you say there, James, ensuring that you are very aware of when that drop off point is and that you've um, strategized the program in you know well to ensure that customers are staying on post that drop off point um as well as that i think if you do have um you know, if if you offer subscription as well as one time purchase make sure that you are segmenting them subscription customers well enough and giving um more to them in terms of in terms of the loyalty program than what you're doing to your regular customers you can still reward regular customers for their one-time purchases but offer more back to your subscription customers because ultimately they're the ones if they keep the subscription running they're going to have longer lifetime value and be purchasing with you much more frequently ultimately so i think things um you know make sure that you've you've got your subscribers in a in a separate tier um where you can be offering different benefits and rewards um one of our sort of free product subscriber rewards you can have them set up um money off and percentage off subscriptions as well um so just really make sure that you've built out um yeah segmentation for your subscription customers usually using a subscriber tier um within loyalty to yeah ensure that they're not dropping off um and they are continuing to to stay long term Fantastic. Yeah, I was, yeah, was going to, oh, after you, James, no, no go ahead. Go on, Tom. Go on, Tom. Um, go. I was going to say, like, it's a, it's a really interesting question that also kind of links back with some of the, some of the questions we've already kind of answered, right? Like, how do you get better user-generated content? How do you collect first-party data? Like, if you're looking at your subscriber customers, they're potentially those customers that are really going to give you that. And, like, keep the, keeping them engaged in that community, I think, is a really good a good approach in general. Like if those customers feel like they're getting more than just the product they're giving by the, the products they're receiving sort of by giving you more into the company, by joining that community and giving content and getting a, a rewarded for that alongside, like those are the customers that are really useful, I think, to, to target with those things as well. Um, they're customers who clearly care enough about the product that you're getting to subscribe to it and get it every month, then utilize that and reward them along the way. Um, would be the only piece I have to add to that. Absolutely, I think I think Ellie's point as well around the, the the tiers is so important because although absolutely we want to be focusing on those subscribers, they're extremely valuable customers to us as a business. It's also important as well that we don't leave those one-time purchases out in the cold. So I think you know the ability to be able to create a program that that suits both people because you will have one-time purchases who are you know regular customers of yours. They just don't like the idea of subscribing to anything. Um, so I think the ability to actually segment between the two, but make sure that, you know, you are absolutely looking after those subscribers and really sort of drilling down on, on where those high risk areas are to ensure that we reduce the churn as much as possible and basically make sure that their interaction with us as a brand is as, um, as pleasant for them as possible as well. Fantastic. Um, excellent. So next question we have here is another question that was asked during one of the breakout sessions. Um, the question was, I work with a couple of brands who want to offer loyalty, but feel that it is against their brand with the gamification. They're a high-end luxury brand. What advice would you give in this instance? 
I think this is a, a really, really interesting question. And the reason I say that is because it's, it's something that I've actually done, you know, quite a lot of work on recently. I think as everybody, know, as, as everybody knows, as Fun technical difficulties as normal. <laughs> well, he's um, I just, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to maybe fill in there with Ellie that while uh, we're waiting for James. But I, if not, we can. Yeah, I think the the question was more around um, how sort of yeah, I guess uh, businesses that are more luxury based where they don't necessarily want to to take into account sort of gamification and they want to still build a loyal customer base, but are worried about um, the points or gamification element um, of that. Um, and I think particularly with brands where um, that is the case, there is definitely different routes you can go down um, to ensure that you're still building a loyal customer base, but you steer clear of, of the gamification element. Um, so if you aren't necessarily wanting to um, do sort of points or, or have rewards where you're heavily discounting, which is obviously given given sort of the luxury industry is something that is very prominent there. They don't want to be heavily discounting things like that. Um, a lot of the times what we recommend doing is having more of just like a tiered based program where you're still setting up sort of spend goals for individual customers. Um, but you don't, um, instead of having sort of uh, monetary discounts, what you do instead is is more experience based rewards in that in that area. So things like um, allowing customers to, um, you know, I guess links to what we did before, like come into store and, and have more of a personalized shopping experience or um, do um, like a champagne reception. I think one of my merchants at the minute, they for certain tiers, they allow you to come into store and get a free glass of champagne or something like that while shopping. Um, so anything that sort of ties to the luxury element um, that you want to give back to make it feel like you're building a little community, you can do it through a tier based program, but you you take away the points element and instead you swap that out for these experiences. Um, so instead of the rewards, it's, it's as I said, it's more experience fed. Um, which allows you to still build on that community element and have um, have a lot of um, customers coming back and, and continuing to shop with you because of the different um, the different approach that you take to to loyalty um, there. But yeah, James, you obviously dropped off, so I wasn't sure um, what what you were gonna what you were gonna say on that one. Yeah, apologies for that. It's the classic, isn't it? Um, <laughs> online, I've come to the office for a stable internet connection. Um, so yeah, I think. The sort of pieces that I picked up from what you were saying there, Ellie, absolutely. Um, and what I was saying is that we have seen this seismic shift in e-commerce, and I think with the issues that everybody is seeing in acquisition, there is this this big, big focus on retention. Right, this is the reason we're all here today, and so much so that we are seeing actually a lot of a number of the luxury houses actually turning and looking at retention and looking at how can this be applied to the luxury market. Um, I think that the, the the kind of typical point that we get is absolutely in line with the question we want to maintain that luxury feel essentially um but i think when you actually look at the statistics there's nothing to say that a program can't resonate with a luxury audience which is really important so one thing that we've seen is we've seen that 86 percent of affluent customers are actually active in at least one loyalty program and that what we find is that 78% of affluent customers say that loyalty programs are actually a very big part of their brand relationships. And that 78% is compared to 71% of traditional customers who wouldn't be considered affluent. So I think, you know, when we start looking at statistics like that, it's less about we don't want a loyalty program because it's affecting the brand image. To Ellie's point, it's more about how do we structure a loyalty program so that it resonates with our customers? Because the most important thing is that you use it as that opportunity to act as an extension of your brand um, and really encourage people to interact with you over you know longer period of time and, and all these sorts of good things. The only other thing I've mentioned here as well is the fact that it's important to keep an eye on, on the future as well, the future of the industry. So if we take into account the fact that traditionally luxury brands would be appealing to you know slightly older generations, um, perhaps older millennials, um, and Gen X traditionally. But when we consider the fact that generations Y and Z 
are actually expected to represent 55% of the market in luxury by 2025. Um, and they are very, very digital focused. It's important to always be thinking about how can we make sure that we are ready for that moving forwards. Awesome. Um, cool. So the next question we have here was asked by Hillary during one of the breakout sessions. Do you have examples of great loyalty programs that don't leverage a point system? And I suppose this follows on a little bit from the last question, actually. So, Ellie, any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think... Sorry, would you mind just repeating the question just so I can get my answer? <laughs> Is that yeah, of right? course, of course. <laughs> just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the question was, do you have examples of great loyalty programs that don't leverage a point system? Yes. Um, so, I, yeah, I think this kind of, I guess, kind of ties into to the last um, the, the last answer, really, in the sense that we do have merchants that don't necessarily want to use points um, and understand me there are reasons for that because I think a lot of the times merchants think that points are you know associated with sort of gamification and things like that but generally my sort of question back to this would be you know what industry are you in what what sort of business are you, are you in and why don't you want to use points because there is a much sort of more sophisticated way in which you can um, push a points uh, a points loyalty program um, and there's a lot more you can do when you make it points based as I said before if you're doing it as just a tiered based program where you're looking at moving your customers through different tiers and having experiences as a result of that, fine, you can definitely do that and it and it can work successfully if you wanted to. But alongside that, you can still have um, the points functionality. And I think um, the points functionality with a loyalty program allows you to push um, push loyalty throughout many different areas of the site. So you can have points that you're earning for products within the product pages. You can have the points that you'll get when purchasing um, the cart. So you can push loyalty, you know, through the whole purchasing journey with the customer. You can have the point slider within, within the checkout. If you're only doing tiers and have these experiences, um, there's a lot less um, sort of ways to engage customers if you're doing it that way. And I think as well as that, you also have the opportunity to... Um, really optimize your your marketing when it comes to your emails and SMS strategy if you have a points-based programs by way of things like points reminders, letting customers know when they're nearing, um, you know, being able to redeem uh, rewards. Um, and, you know, you have a much greater um, program if you combine the points and experience slash benefits element into it. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I would question as to, you know, why are you against the points? Um, and is there sort of a way that we can work around it to make sure that customers are um, really open to having that points-based program and that you can do that alongside sort of just having tier experiences as well as, as, well as the points, if that makes sense. But yeah, I don't know, James or Tom, if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. And I think it all it all kind of boils down into strategy, really, right? It's what's the strategy? What are you looking to drive from your retention program? Um, and also just, just being aware of the industry you're in, the customers you have, all of these different sorts of things. So I completely understand the question. I think, you know, to sort of echo Ellie's point, I think if you allow customers to have a points-based system, whatever that looks like, it does give you further breadth within the program in terms of the things you can offer and the way that people can interact. It also gives you the ability to create, um, to actually incentivize people a little bit better in terms of the ways that they're, they're progressing and moving. Um, but also, I think, again, to Ellie's point, it's about how you, how you present it to people. You know, just thinking of a customer off the top of my head, Edgar and Cooper, who we work with, they have a points-based system. Um, however, instead of using the term points, for example, as a dog and cat food company, they use the term belly rubs, you know, so it's, it's again, thinking very hard about, you know, who your customers are and how you can actually present the program in a way that's really actually going to resonate with them um, and kind of putting that first, essentially. And Tom, anything from you on that? Um, yeah, I think just Jenny, I, I, I'd agree with everything you've said there. Like the, as you, as you mentioned, like having those points as an underlying mechanic gives you another lever that you can pull. Um, you can do one off, 
like bonus points for attending particular events and all those things can yeah link through and just gives you more opportunities to help people progress um so yeah i essentially echo everything you guys have said excellent um so moving on then to another couple of questions and james i just conscious there's a question in the chat i don't want to miss okay. that um before we oh, move on we to the others yeah so thank you jason for your question so the question is have you come across any examples of brands who work on a loyalty community in social mediums like discord or reddit and do platforms like loyalty line do anything in those spaces um so i, I can speak a little bit on this one i wouldn't i don't have any example of, of brands directly that we work with but um speaking on like the the product that loyalty line offers like we we offer the ability to create like custom custom rules and custom rewards so as long as like the behind the scenes like you're able to help manage those things we can essentially reward points for many different things so that could be uh, subscribing or joining the the, uh, the discord channel that could be involved being involved in the community potentially being a moderator on one of the on the subreddits like those different things um are data points that you're able to push to loyalty line via custom custom rules so you could have a, a rule that rewards 100 points when you subscribe to when you join the the discord channel and when you do that as long as you have a way of telling and informing loyalty line about that that event happening then you can absolutely reward points for that um, and that extends beyond those two as well, sort of any different, any different social mediums or online or offline that exist. That it could be as simple as joining the the sort of local community group. Like if you have a way of doing that and managing people who come and come come every week, then by all means you can you can push that data to Loyalty Line. Um, I don't know if Ellie or James have examples of merchants that are maybe using some of those rules to to do similar things. I think people have done stuff with TikTok and stuff potentially as well, maybe. Yeah, I think with with anything like this, um, if you're looking at other other channels that you're potentially utilizing it in any in any sort of way, it's how you can bring that into your loyalty program that you you have sort of on on your site. Um, and yeah, as as Tom said, our custom um, rule functionality does allow you to direct traffic there and sort of include that within your loyalty program. Um, but I'd also say just on on the community element, whilst you can sort of um, you know if you've got Discord or Reddit, that's you are, you've got a bit, you know, a big focus on and you're wanting to, you know, push customers there, don't forget about uh, building community, you know, within your actual loyalty program itself, rather than um, having, you know, different custom rules and having a community elsewhere. Um, so although you can sort of tie that into to your loyalty program, I think building out um, a community, um, you know, within the loyalty program that is on site um, it is important as well. Um, and I think that comes down to sort of having different rules um, and rewards. Like a, a big portion of that is is the variety um, that you offer. Um, and also things like your, your marketing strategy, um, the emailing of that, uh, bringing customers together um, in your own way, essentially. Um, but yeah, James, I don't know if you had anything. Well. Yeah, I, th I think absolutely what you just said there, um, it was, it was bringing customers together in your own way, I think is so important. And, uh, and, and thank you very much, Jason, for the question, because I think it actually highlights a very important point is that community isn't a one size fits all approach, right? And I think if you do find that you have a very, very engaged community on these channels, Discord, Reddit, for example, then it is a case of, you know, how do we then start to incorporate that into the loyalty program? Because to your follow up point, um, Jason, for everybody who's listening, Jason goes on to point out that um, the challenge with these newer channels is the need for authenticity um, and in general, a distaste of marketing in these channels. So I think if I understand that correctly, it's a case of, you know, these more traditional channels, your edits, that sort of thing. There are, you know, sort of deeper connections that exist already and there are communities that are established already. And I think absolutely, if, there, if there's a way that you can leverage these as, as Tom has um, outlined for us, then I think it's an extremely effective way of actually using a program to engage those those customers um, and drive those relationships moving forwards. Yeah, I think the just uh, to, fo to follow up on yeah that second point that Jason raised, I think it's very important to identify what those customers want from you as well. Like a lot of that marketing distrust and stuff comes from, at least from my perspective, a lot of the sort of more like traditional marketing avenues and picking rewards and things like that that maybe resonate with members of those communities better. They're more likely to be potentially more digital-based rewards, 
things that are sort of more up and coming. Um, I'm not going to say the word NFT on this call, but like those kind of things do exist. And I have opinions. Like I'm sure everyone's got opinions on what those things look like moving forward. But I think that they're hard to miss, right? That there's going to be some form of digital rewards that potentially resonate better with that community um, and things like that. So identifying what, what those people actually want and how you can engage with them without yeah, I did say it. <laughs> it's hard to ignore. Shopify have a beta out for this stuff. So it's, it's happening whether we want it to happen or not. So I think there's, it's interesting to engage with those communities and understand what they want. I think it's more the it's my overarching point there. Absolutely. And thank you very much, Jason. Um, a, a really, really good question. Um, okay, so we've got about five minutes left. So I think we've potentially got time just for one last question. Um, so... The last question that I, I want to sort of bring up is a question that was asked a little bit earlier. How can brands continue to remain human in an ever-evolving political landscape? Something that I actually think is is extremely pertinent at the moment. Um, Ellie, any thoughts on this from yourself? Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a very important one. Um, and I think having a loyalty program is is a very great way to do it. <laughs> um, with the loyalty program, you know, if you are consistent with that and you can build a, a really great community throughout, you know, through your loyalty program on site, it is a very, you know, a really great way to ensure that um, you're building, you know, a customer base that wants to return to your store, are spending a lot with you guys. They are, they're not churning. They, they essentially build that connection with you guys and they have that relationship with you. Um, and I think driving that through, through loyalty um, is, 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 yeah, is a really great way to do it essentially. Absolutely. I think, I think one of the keys here is that absolutely to your point, Ellie, I think a loyalty program is a fantastic opportunity through that engagement to really communicate what's important to you as a brand. You know, it's a really important way for you to, put political beliefs but you know more sort of what you believe as a brand at the forefront of those communications and also give people who share that belief system the ability to interact with you as a brand um and you know as we all know once we share a belief system with one of our customers or consumers then they're much more engaged moving forwards you know and we find that we have a much much deeper relationship with them um and then you know sort of how in terms of maintaining that in an ever evolving political landscape, I think is just to stay true, you know, stay true to, to what, what is important to you as a brand. You know, we have a number of brands who have absolutely built their brand around a, a core pillar of sustainability. For example, sustainability is a hot topic. It's, it's something that's on everybody's lips moving into 2022, less of a nice to have more of an essential these days. Um, but, you know, it's essential that, you know, as things change and, um, trends change and that sort of thing you stay true to who you are um, because you'll find that you naturally attract people who, who do share that same belief system and it means that you'll those customers that do as I mentioned before will be a lot deeper engaged with you as a brand awesome fantastic so I think, uh, I think we're nearly at four o'clock okay yeah great I can jump in there, James. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much to James, Tom and Ellie. I think a really interesting set of questions there and um, learned a lot from you. So thank you so much. 